All right, let's get started. Um, our first speaker, oops. our first speaker is Dr. Winnie Tahiri. Um, and Winnie, you can come up so long and they read you up. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to hear Wendy speak last year at a small health conference, um, and uh, I think her message should be brought out much more in terms of our production systems. So we have invited her to come again. And uh, so if I put a, a CV, quick CV for you, um, it, Wendy Tahiri is a specialist in the vascular my mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF. She has earned a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology with a minor in plant science from Indiana University. Her graduate research demonstrated that selection of the right AMF communities could increase plant biomass as much as 69%. Realizing the tremendous benefits these organisms could bring to agriculture, she went to work for the USDA. Her research focused on developing molecular tools that would allow routine assessments of AMF in agricultural soils. She also examined, man, um, um, examined manipulating cover crops to select the best micro, uh, microbial communities for the subsequent cash crop. After completing two consecutive terms of the USDA, she, focused the research, uh, she founded the research company Terra Nimbus, which is working to develop more effective solutions to the challenges faced by modern, modern farmers. A vascular mycorrhizal fungi, fungi are plant symbiotes that affect every aspect of plant physiology. Dr. Thierry explains the basics of mycorrhizal fungi, the importance in cropping systems, and how they are affected by our management decisions. Wendy. Thank you. Okay. 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 I'm going to talk down here, I think, so I can pace. So um, uh, this is sort of a AMF. AMF is short for arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And that's kind of a mouthful, so we just call it AMF for short. And this is a, sort of a crash course in uh, what they do for farmers, what they do in your soil, what their role is, and uh, how you can manage for them if you want more. Which after you hear me talk, I hope you'll be saying, yes, I want more. <laughs> so. You need a, a little terminology to help you along. Uh, there, this is a Latin term, arbuscular. In the United States, we have Arbor Day. Do you guys celebrate that? What do you do on Arbor Day? Plant a tree, yeah. So if you, these are arbuscules right here. See how they look like a tiny microscopic tree inside the cells of the plant's roots. So that's where the name came, arbuscular. And scule is Latin for minuscule, tiny. So they look like tiny trees when you look at them. The, I took this picture, this is actually a corn root. This is maize, and that's the, the cell wall, and there's two arbuscules inside that. And when a plant's root is filled with these arbuscules, we call it a colonized root, and it's colonized by the mycorrhizal, and they're endo. Endo means interior, inside. They're not just inside the roots, they're inside the individual cells. So plants want to be colonized by mycorrhizal fungi, so they send out a hormone to stimulate germination of spores. And then they prepare a channel between the cells and guide the hyphae, the filaments, these are called hyphae, through the root to the cells where they want the arbuscules. And then they form a membrane that surrounds that, and that becomes the point of exchange between the plant and the fungus. So the fungus actually becomes an extension of the plant. It lives inside the plant, and then the hyphae go out into the soil and become an extension of the plant's root system. And they behave as a single organism working together. Another type of mycorrhizal fungi are the ectomycorrhizae. They're not the same, and they aren't gonna really colonize your, your crop plants for the most part, unless you're an orchid grower or grow pine trees, then you'll have ectomycorrhizae. Ectomycorrhizae form a, a mushroom. Uh, the arbuscular mycorrhizae are endo and they never, never form any kind of visible structure. They can only be seen under the microscope. So that's how you know your mycorrhiza. 90% of all plant families form this association. And that's most of our crops. All the cereal grains are mycorrhizal plants. So I'm going to give you 16 reasons that you should care about mycorrhizal fungi. 
I'm going to walk that over here, shall I? Um, they help increase your soil fertility. They build soil structure. They're one of the organisms that are responsible for the formation of soil aggregates. They actually excrete a substance called a glycoprotein that binds those aggregates together and uh, makes them water stable. So they increase the water holding capacity of the soil as well as aeration. They produce a more nutritious product for both humans and livestock. So if we grow the same plants with and without mycorrhiza, the ones with the mycorrhiza will be more nutrient dense. Uh, they can be used to replace harmful chemicals. There's no chemicals that don't have side effects in, in agriculture. If you try and kill one thing, you're going to kill a bunch of other things. So, so we recommend that chemicals be used. If you need to use the chemical to get something under control, it's a signal that there's something out of balance in your system. Because usually you're treating the symptom, not the cause. And you need to rethink, what's happening here? Why did I need that chemical to begin with? So if you have healthy soil that's rich in mycorrhiza, you're really not going to find yourself a lot of pests and, and problems that require a lot of chemical use. Um, because they induce nutrient use efficiency in plants, then you have less leaching and runoff. Uh, and they're especially well studied for the amount of phosphorus they bring plants. They help plants uptake phosphorus. They can double the amount of phosphorus that gets out of the soil and into your plant. Uh, they increase essential oil production. So if you are growing mint crops or something for the oils, or now we've got the cannabis industry coming online, which are essential oils that they use for medical cannabis. Um, that's a, a mycorrhizal fungi play a role there as well. They can protect plants from nematodes, and I'm going to go into that in a little detail, because when I was a student, said, a fungus is protecting plants from nematodes, from a worm, from an animal. I said, right, how's it doing that? Well, I learned how it does that, and I'm going to share that with you today. Protection from fungal and bacterial plant diseases. They induce drought tolerance, salinity resistance, earlier flowering, more flowers, more food. That's the same as more biomass or better yields. They sequester carbon in the soil. All that carbon in the atmosphere is doing harm. Well, that carbon is used to manufacture the glycoproteins that form your soil structure. So the agricultural system is actually large enough to draw down industrial carbon dioxide and put it in the soil under the best management practices, which is an amazing thing. And we're doing some research now that we expect and hope will demonstrate that how we manage cattle in our farming systems can actually offset all the industrial carbon we've put in the air in the last hundred years uh, within a few decades. Uh, pollinators prefer mycorrhizal plants. So they did these experiments where they took uh, plants in, in pots and half of them were mycorrhiza and half of them weren't and they mixed them all up. And then students sat around all day counting <laughs> where the pollinators came. And the pollinators preferentially went to the mycorrhizal plants. They could tell them apart. And they never explained why, but I think it's because they can actually detect the nutrient richness. It's kind of like smelling a steak. You know when it smells good, right? You go to that. Um, if the other one doesn't have all the spices and everything you like, you're going to move away from it. Yes, sirree. They can grow hair, fix your teeth, and make you taller. But they do everything, right? These guys are great. So the question here is really, Really, can one thing do all of that? That, that that's, that's a big list of things. And the truth is no. One thing, one organism is not doing all of that. It's the community of AMF that conveyed multiple benefits. It's not just one thing. It's a whole community. Their diversity is what brings all those benefits. So you should always be looking to get more mycorrhizae, more species of mycorrhizae. Now, to some extent, and you're looking at mycorrhizal spores here, except for that one, that's something else. But for, for um, the most part, they all do everything on that list to some extent. But just like all of our children can draw, if you put a crayon in their hand, some of them are future Michelangelo's, right? <laughs> so some of these are particularly good at specific items on that list. For instance, these large spores belong to the Gigaspora family, Giga for gigantic spore, and they make some of the largest, most intensive networks of hyphae through the soil. Some of these, these guys primarily occupy the roots, and if the roots are occupied by mycorrhizae, then uh, pathogenic fungi 
the disease causing fungi can't get into the root because they're defended. We can have colonization up to 90% and nothing is going to get into those roots and cause root disease if these guys are present. And I had someone send me some, uh, some samples from some maize that they had grown and they said we, all, we had cover crops, this was in the Midwest, in the US, uh, on the field and the only difference, this was all one field, is on one half we terminated the cover crops a little early, we burned them down with glyphosate and then, and then a little bit of time passed before we got to the second batch. They didn't tell me which was which, but when I got the samples, one was colonized by mycorrhiza and the other was colonized by pathogenic fungi. And she said you could see it night and day between the two sides of the field. That, that even low colonization will protect your plants uh, from a lot of pathogens. Because their colonization was, was only at 20%, which is very low. But the ones that had the pathogens had no colonization. So, to get microbial diversity in your soil, you must have plant diversity. Literally, plant diversity begets microbial diversity. And if you're here till Thursday, I'll explain a little bit more about how diversity functions and how it works. Um, for every aspect of plant physiology ever tested, mycorrhizal fungi influenced it. That's how integrated they are into the plant's life cycle, into its entire life, every stage of growth. And um, uh, they are keystone species in soil. This means when they disappear, the system begins to collapse. So if you remove all your mycorrhizal fungi from your soil, your beneficial bacteria and other beneficial fungi also vanish. They decline severely when you remove the mycorrhiza. So picture the soil and all the aggregates and all the air spaces and imagine you're a single-celled organism. You're a bacteria and the food is where the roots are. The roots feed everything. They secrete carbon and sugars directly into the soil for the purpose of feeding microbes. Plants are farmers. We think we're the farmers. The plants are the farmers. They're actually farming bacteria and fungi because those are the organisms that cycle the nutrients and make them available to the plant. So you're this tiny, tiny organism and you want to get to the plant roots. You have to go and around this particle, around this particle, around this particle. The only way you're going to get there is if there's a big rain that lets you swim there, right? But the hyphae bridge all those gaps. They're a super highway that goes directly to the roots. So microbes travel along the hyphae to reach the roots. That means the mycorrhizal fungi can encourage the beneficials and chemically attack the things that they don't want to reach their host. They're what we call an obligate symbiote, which means if their host dies, they die. They can't live without a host. So they defend that host with vigor. And we're never going to be sustainable, and better than sustainable is to be regenerative without this association. Because they, they bring so much to the, to the plant, because they increase their growth, they increase their, their protection, and they increase their nutrient content. These factors play a big role in how sustainable our agriculture is. So if we have a healthy soil system and the mycorrhiza are at work, then we, get, um, uh, we can reduce our inputs, and that means uh, less pollution, less leaching, less things flowing out to our oceans and our water systems because you just put in what you need and, you, and these organisms will transfer it directly into the roots. So these are all the, the, the macro and micronutrients that plants need. That's, that's everything that most people would say goes into plants. There's a few other things that you could discuss, but that's the primary ones, the main ones. So we got NPK, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and then all the micronutrients. So I've already mentioned phosphorus. So place your bets. Which one of these, besides just phosphorus, do you think mycorrhizal uh, fungi can transfer into the plant roots that they can directly make available from its unavailable form to an available form? All of them. The only reason molybdenum is not lit up is I could not find a research paper where anyone tested it. But I'll bet if we tested it, we'd find it's there too. So that shows you how important these organisms are to plants. Their lives are dedicated to keeping that host healthy. 
because the healthier the host is, the more carbon they get. They can't even uptake their own food or manufacture their own food. All their food comes directly from the plant. And they're so important to the plant that they co-evolved together. Scientists have found mycorrhizal fungi in the fossil record, and we believe that they actually helped plants colonize land. That's how long. It's the oldest known symbiosis to science. So as, as the microbes help the, the plants break down and make nutrients available, the plants feed them carbon. And it's so important that they will feed as much of their carbon as 30% straight to the mycorrhizae without competition from inside their roots directly. Then if an arbuscle is not giving them enough phosphorus, and in natural systems, phosphorus is very scarce, so the decision-making process for the plant is all based on phosphorus, then they, they control the symbiosis by simply dissolving the arbuscle. They have complete control over the relationship. If it's not profitable for them, they can terminate the relationship, which uh, is how we believe they remain symbiotes and didn't devolve into parasites. Because everything's out for itself in nature, right? So that was a big, one of the big mysteries in science was why didn't they become parasites? Because the plant controls the relationship, is what we finally figured out. So I can't go over all those 16 things, why you should care about AMF, uh, within an hour. <laughs> so I picked out the four that I think farmers are most interested in, which is increasing your yield, freeing up phosphorus, drought tolerance, and biological control of disease. So in 2005, two scientists, Leckberg and Coity, looked at 290 field of greenhouse experiments, and we call this a meta-study. So you have all these experiments, and they're all a little bit different, so they're not directly comparable but there are special statistics that you can apply that compensate for differences. And, and we call that a meta-study. And in general, what they found across all management practices, the good, the bad, the ugly, is that if you can increase your root colonization, your yield will increase an average of 23%. Who wants to walk away from that? <laughs> it's like, that's pretty good. Even if you have the worst management practices, you the average is still 23%. Imagine if you have the best management practices, what that would be. So AIM fungi, in general, mean higher yields. Now, this is an older study, and it's showing the effect of mycorrhizae, uh, showing the uh, copper, zinc, and phosphorus content of 40-day-old soybeans. I chose this study to demonstrate this because this is a very typical result that you see across a lot of plant species, not just soybean. Uh, so here's with no mycorrhizae in black and with mycorrhizae in gray, and if you deny mycorrhizae in most plants, they grow very poorly. They're not getting all the extra nutrients they could have gotten with the help of mycorrhizae. So the dry weight is one-third again more when mycorrhizae are colonizing the, the plant. Copper is insignificant. It doesn't make much difference. Copper is toxic to most fungi, so that didn't really surprise me when I learned that. Zinc, triple, phosphorus, doubled. Very common. And we're finding now, as we lose mycorrhizae in our system, because we put so many sides, pesticide, herbicide, insecticide, fungicide, we have so many things that kill things in soil that we're sterilizing our soil, we're losing our bacteria, and we're also losing our mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, with the loss of them, there goes half your phosphorus right there that they're responsible for. So you gotta keep those guys going. And here's how it works with the phosphorus. Mycorrhizal fungi, when a plant is colonized, it actually increases its rate of photosynthesis to compensate for the extra carbon it wants to feed to the mycorrhizal fungi. So, you, so this is where our nutrient use efficiency comes in, because now we've stimulated more photosynthesis, and they're feeding sugar, sugars, directly to the mycorrhiza. That's a, that's a spore. And then the mycorrhizae are extremely efficient at taking up minerals. So they take up minerals and they feed it to the plants. And the plants are extremely efficient at photosynthesis, which is where the sugar comes from. So it's like paying an expert to do a job for you that they can do better than you and faster. And this is the cycle. And then we come along and we spend a bunch of money on phosphorus, which the price is never gonna go down. In fact, it's gonna keep going up and up and up. 
It's projected that by 2040, we will have reached peak mycorrhizal, uh, or I'm sorry, peak phosphorus, which means um, the supply is dwindling. And we're more than halfway through the world supply, which by the way, is all 70% of it is controlled by one man. One man controls 70% of the world's phosphorus supply. It's the king of Morocco. And when, in the United States, when we brought on the ethanol into our fuel systems and made it a law that you had to put 10% ethanol, all of a sudden everybody planted corn and there was a, a phosphorus shortage. There was a fertilizer shortage in general, but phosphorus especially. And uh, for the United States, we have a domestic supply. We saw a 400% increase in phosphor phosphorus prices. The rest of the world saw an 800% increase. That's more than double what we saw when OPEC um, uh, stopped selling oil to us and the prices, prices uh, doubled. But this is, this is twice as much as that. So that means this market is going to be more volatile than oil because it's inconvenient if you have to walk to work. But it's a disaster if you can't feed your nation. So we have to keep an eye on what's happening with the phosphorus. This planet has about 200 nations on it and only 20 of those nations have their own phosphorus supply. And in the United States, we have about 3% of the world's phosphorus, and we're using it faster than anyone else because we export the most phosphorus. By 2040, we're going to be out. And our cropping systems will be entirely dependent on foreign sources of phosphorus. So you have to think about that. Are you one of those 20 countries? Do you have your own supply? What's going to happen uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? So. Here we come, we dump phosphorus in here, and we spend money on that phosphorus, and how does that affect the relationship of the plant? Well, the plant decides whether or not it wants to be colonized according to how much phosphorus is in the soil. And again, during their whole evolutionary, you know, 400 million years of evolution, phosphorus was rare. So they almost always, except in rare instances where there might be growing near a deposit, needed more phosphorus. But now we've altered things, and the plant says, oh, plenty of phosphorus. I don't need to supply mycorrhizal fungi with anything. And the plant doesn't have a brain like us and say, well, if I cut off my, my, my supply to the microbes, I won't, I'll lose all the things on that list of 16 reasons that the mycorrhizae are helping me. They only make the decision based on phosphorus, because that's all that they evolved to do. Then you can say goodbye to your mycorrhizae and everything on that list that comes with them. And you can try and do the job of the mycorrhizae by spending a ton of money. And you'll never do the job that they can do. There are no chi chemicals, there's no combination of chemicals in the world that will do everything the mycorrhizae do for your plants. Doesn't exist. Goodbye free phosphorus. When you buy phosphorus and put it in your soil, uh, it immediately begins binding to everything. It's like a magnet. It's a highly charged molecule. And so the second it hits your soil, it's becoming unavailable that quickly. So that means less than 20% of what you actually put in your field, if you get 20%, you're doing good, will actually go into your plant. So it's not how much you put on the ground, it's how much you get into your plant that, that matters to your pocketbook, right? That's going to be your, your, your yield. This is just like buying a gallon of gas, or 10 gallons of gas, and putting 40 gallons of gas and throwing it away and using it to kill fish. This is how we treat phosphorus today. Because it winds up, with it, what doesn't go into the plant, leaches away or erodes away and winds up in the water eventually, where it causes its own unique problems, eutrophication. I have another name for this. I call it burning your money. <laughs> if it doesn't get in the plant, it's not doing you any good. And I once had a conversation with a fertilizer salesman, and I said, if only 20% of the phosphorus is getting in my plant, where is the other 80% going? And he said to me, well, it's still in your soil. It'll become available next year. And I said, oh, good. That means I don't need to buy any fertilizer for next year. And he said, oh, no, you got to buy, you gotta buy fertilizer. Well, if, if it's still waiting to become available next year, why would I need to add more? I should only have to buy phosphorus every five years, right? At this rate, no, 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 you gotta keep buying it. So, you know, nothing he said to me made any sense, except keep giving me your money. 
that made sense. So you have to think about how we utilize this, how we can get it out of the soil and into the plants and not have that excess being lost. We need nutrient efficient plants, plants that uptake the nutrients and we reduce our inputs to match what they can't uptake. So aim fungi can help save money on chemical fertilizers. And that means your cost of doing business is lower. So drought tolerance. I really questioned this when I was a student. I said, they're so small, you need a microscope to see them. How much water can they really uptake for a plant? It just didn't seem like it made a lot of sense back then. And the roots are big and the hyphae are small. And I had this picture in my mind of a big straw, little straw. The little straw, you're like sucking in your cheeks trying to get more water up. But actually, it's the surface area that uptakes the water, right? So, um, Ruiz Lozano and Ascon came up with a really clever experiment to measure how much water the hyphae could actually transport directly into the plant. So what they did was they took a tube and they put um, sand, they grew these plants in sand, and they put a mesh, a very fine mesh, 50 micron mesh. The roots are too big to go through it, but it's large enough for the hyphae to go through it. And so they had a root compartment and then just a little separator where the hyphae could pass through this compartment, and then they injected the water at the bottom. And with sand, you're not going to get a whole lot of travel upwards of your water, because water tends to pass through sand and go down. So most of the water is going to stay down here. And then they said, well, mycorrhizae are so good at scavenging phosphorus, it's going to find phosphorus even in sand. So we're going to fertilize our control to make sure that the effects we see aren't because the plant didn't grow well due to a lack of fertilizer. So they actually gave a phosphate fertilizer to the control, and then they, they used two different species of mycorrhiza, and this is Glomus fasciculatum, Glomus deserticola. Deserticola, where do you think that came from? Desert, desert. Do you think if I went out and bought a bunch of that and put it in my field, it would help my plants? Yeah, think about that. Can a polar bear live in the desert? When you buy a lot of these, these products, you gotta be careful, because guess what? That's, that, that stuff colonizes cacti, not crops. So don't, don't let the names fool you. And then our pea fertilizer controls, place your bets. Who's the winner? More fresh weight for desertical, 215% more fresh weight than the control. 150% more fresh weight than the control with the fasciculatum. That's water that they were carrying up. So they can actually absorb quite a bit of water. Furthermore, the hyphae, these filaments that, that have a structure very similar to roots, so the branching structure, are so small, they're smaller than root hairs, they can penetrate pore spaces that roots can't get into. So there's unavailable water even during a drought that's in such a small space, the surface tension of the water is too great and the space is too small for roots to access but the hyphae can get in there and make that water available. Also, keep in mind, things that are done in pots are not what happens in the field. So I can get Lomus desert to colonize any plant in a pot because that pot is a prison. And if you're in prison and you hate Brussels sprouts but all I feed you is Brussels sprouts, what are you gonna eat? <laughs> you can eat the Brussels sprouts. So plants want mycorrhiza so bad that when you put it in a pot, they'll associate with most, almost anything. This led to the erroneous concept that mycorrhiza were generalists and they would colonize anything in the field. But as we began doing DNA testing of roots, we found inside the roots, plants were very specific. They didn't even colonize by what was most common in the soil. They picked who they wanted to colonize them. And no matter what kind of soil you move them to, they still pick the same species. They want to be colonized by the guys they like, the guys they evolved with. So don't let pot cultures fool you into thinking that you can get deserticola into your, into your maize or your, or, or your other cereal crops. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> but people will sell it to you and tell you it will. So be aware. So in fungi means money saved on losses due to drought. In the United States, we have crop insurance. Do you guys have that? Yes, no? You do, you do. 
So if you have to get crop insurance, that's worse than bringing in a, even a poor crop. So one of the things that we've observed is people with good soil quality and good management are less likely to need to rely on crop insurance because honestly, healthy soil is the best crop insurance you could have. In Australia, they don't have it. If you don't take care of your soil and you can't grow a crop, you go out of business. In some ways, I, I think that's good. In other ways, it's like, well, we have to do something, right, to keep our farmers farming. So I, I don't know the answer to that, what's better, but uh, here we go. Biocontrol agents aim to protect their hosts from a variety of pathogens, including nematodes. And these diseases, now that I've given, a lot of, given this talk in a lot of different places, seem to be prevalent everywhere. So everybody has problems with fusarium. Have you guys had problems with fusarium? Yeah, pythium? Some of these are familiar. Uh, these are the organisms that cause it, Rhizoctonia, verticillium. I'm not going to read the whole list. And the names often have the same, the same uh, thing. We have root rot, root rot and legumes. Take all disease, root rot disease complex, root rot. But they're caused by different organisms. And in particular, this root rot disease complex is caused by uh, nematodes. Once they, they scratch the, the root, once they uh, wound the root, there's now an opportunity for opportunistic organisms to jump in and cause secondary infection. Just like, here's my arm. Am I gonna just get an infection on my arm? But if I cut my arm, I have a better chance of getting infection. It's the same thing that happens with our plants. Once you breach the outer defense, which is the cell walls, in us, it's our skin, uh, then other things have an opportunity. They may have never been able to breach that defense, but once someone else does it for them, they're in. So uh, AMF are extremely efficient at preventing disease. Colonized roots simply don't become colonized by pathogens. It's a war. So the thing that surprised me the most was the nematode studies. I'm like, come on, what are they going to do against a nematode? And I was quite surprised at some of the things I learned. So we've got our super fungi versus nematodes, and here's one of the mechanisms at work. So here's our plants. If you're a mycorrhizal fungi, you're not attached to just one plant. You're attached to the surrounding plants too. Through your hyphae, they spread out, just like our roots spread out and interact. But they can interconnect the plants because they're living inside the roots. Even if the plants are different species, they still interconnect them. And then here comes our nematode, and he's going to chomp on, on this guy. So the yellow guys are interconnected to each other. They don't interconnect across species. And then the orange guys are all interconnected to each other. And what happens is the mycorrhizas say, oh, a nematode's coming. So they're an extension of the root system, so they're going to detect the nematodes first. It's a nematode. It's going to eat my host. I'm going to die. I have to send out a signal. They'll actually take over the plant's natural defense system and turn on its chemical defenses to create plasmonic acid and other compounds that nematodes don't want and don't like. So that signal doesn't just go to the plant they're connected to, it travels through the hyphae and it, it turns on the defenses for everyone in the area. Now when the nematode says, eh, this plant isn't tasting so good, I'm going to go chew on somebody else, the next plant has already got its defenses activated. The next one does too. He's got to go further before he finds a naive victim that has not already activated his defenses, and then the whole thing happens again. So let's take a look at some data. AMF versus soybean cyst nematode. Damage was offset or reduced 36%. In a review of nematode, AMF nematode interactions, they found that AMF are most effective against the root knot and cyst nematodes, and they reduced plant damage in these groups by an average of 22%. So that's less damage. And this was really amazing. They're particularly effective against stunt nematodes, and they cause a decrease in nematode numbers by 21%. In nematode numbers, and they found that they were selectively killing female nematodes. Now, I'm a biologist, and I know. If I want to control a population, I don't shoot the males. I go out and I shoot the females. Because it doesn't take very many males to keep everything going. 
you want to control a population, you get rid of the females. No one knows exactly how they're doing it, but they found some chemical way of targeting the female nematodes. Migrating nematodes, the mycorrhizal plants were more than twice the size of the non-mycorrhizal controls. Twice the size. Now let's take a little look at the effects of tillage. See all this dust in the air? If you have never seen that behind a tractor, raise your hand. <laughs> not, not one hand, okay? So, so I'm here to remind you, this is not where your dirt belongs. <laughs> but if I'm the guy next door, I know that this is the topsoil that's being sent up in the air, which means it's the most nutrient-rich soil on your farm. It's also the most biologically active soil on your farm. So I'm hoping all this is going to settle on my farm. Because now I don't need to fertilize. Thank you very much. So what's going on here? We've got our plant. We put it in the ground. And it germinates. And these little colored lines re represent the fungal hyphae, the mycorrhizal hyphae. And the yellow lines are the roots. And the, we never plant just one seed, right? So then roots and hyphae interact. And when I made this, I just did a copy and paste. It's just a, a, a concept drawing. And then we harvest. And all those hyphae remain behind. Okay, the roots are there too, but I'm only going to talk about the, the mycorrhizal side of things. Because the roots break down and turn into food. They're nutrients and they add carbon to the soil. We want those roots to be left behind. But the hyphae are also left behind. And then we come back and we plant the next season. And when that seed germinates, it germinates into all of this, assuming we had not tilled that network remains intact. And I just erased everything that was not in contact with the root. So when this seedling germinates, it immediately has access to that much extra, may as well be roots, right? Extra volume of soil for nutrient uptake. And if we compare that to a non-mycorrhizal plant, look at the difference. Not only do we have the surface area, which can be over 100 times more surface area than bare roots, but we have a larger volume of soil to, to seek those nutrients in. In corn, so I did most of my research on, on maize or corn, and in corn, the, the, there was this wonderful study done in, in uh, Canada at Guelph University by a man named Miller. It was a five-year study to try and tease apart what mattered, what really controlled our yield potential in corn. That's what they were trying, trying to address. And what they found was the only thing that really mattered as far as your yield potential for corn was phosphorus. And it wasn't just pile on more phosphorus. It was how much phosphorus you got out of the soil and into your plant before the five leaf stage. Adding phosphorus after that did not do any good. The plant had already made its biochemical decision of how much was available and how big its corns, its ears were going to be and how many rows and how many seeds it could afford to make, that decision is made at the five leaf stage. So adding more phosphorus won't affect it. So your goal is to try and maximize, get as close as you can to that yield potential, right? What's the most I can get? Who do you think is going to get the most early phosphorus? Is that a trick question? No, it's not. <laughs> now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I drew this grid across there to simulate the effects of tillage. And we've broken up the network. And instead of this whole intact network, what you have are little fragments of mycorrhizal hyphae in your soil. And that's what colonizes your roots now, those little fragments. You can barely see them, but they're there. They will still convey most of the benefits that are on that list. Your roots, when they're, when they're uh, particularly biocontrolled, you'll still get a lot of biological control because they will infiltrate the roots and colonize them and keep everything else out of the roots and defend those roots. But as far as your early phosphorus is concerned, you just shot yourself in the foot. There goes your yield potential. It just dropped the minute you destroyed that network. So did the extra drought protection because the network isn't there and what do the mycorrhizae do when the network's not there? So normally when those spores germinate, they travel through the old network. They're still attached to it if you have not tilled your soil. 
So is it easier, which takes more energy, to hack a path through the jungle or to run down a path that, that you know, the pigs made? So now they have to create new pathways. That means they need more energy. Where do they get all their food? All their food. Where does it come from? The plant. Carbon and sugar is directly fed to them from inside the roots by the plant. All their food comes from the plant, all of it. You just increase the cost of the symbiosis. Now the plant has to work harder and get less back because the network is gone. So then they immediately start growing out because the network's not there. They're spending more energy to grow a new network. They start trying to rebuild it. So how does our soil respond to tillage? Not just the mycorrhiza, but our soil in general. Uh, well, we find that AMF and other beneficial microbes decline severely. It causes erosion. It causes compaction. When you introduce oxygen deeper into your soil profile, you activate aerobic microbes, aerobic bacteria, that normally don't get much oxygen deeper you, the deeper you go. And when they suddenly have oxygen, they have a population boom. What do they eat? They eat all the carbon in your soil. So your carbon goes down and your water holding capacity goes down, your CEC declines. Tillage causes a lot of damage that's harmful to your soil that ultimately has a negative impact on your plants. Uh, as you lose your carbon, you lose your water holding capacity. Also, because of timing, we kill our predatory insects, but we don't kill the pests. So Mother Nature says the spiders and predators aren't going to come out until the food is there first. So after they've wintered over, first the things that we would consider pests, the things that eat plants, come out of the soil first. After that is usually when we till, because they come out early, and they're ready, ready to, to, to go, and then we till, and these predators have not come out of the soil yet, and we often kill most of them that way. Bury them too deep to escape. Uh, and tillage plants weeds. If you have a weed problem, you propagate it every time you till. How does that happen? Well, there's a reason we bury our plants. We don't just throw the seeds on the ground, right? We bury those seeds because it protects them. If, when weed seeds usually blow in, they land on the surface. They land on the surface of the ground. If you're on the surface of the ground, the temperatures are more extreme. When it's cold, it's colder. When it's warm, it's war warmer. It's hotter. Under the soil, you're protected from those extremes. But also, you're exposed to seed predators. So, so your seed bank is always constantly being depleted. But as soon as you till, you actually plant those weeds. You bury them in the soil and give them the same protection you gave your crop. So a lot of people, particularly in the organic sector, we found use tillage to control weeds, but they're actually propagating their weeds. If you want to eliminate your weed problem, you have to use up the seed bank. That means get everything to germinate you can and kill it. Come back and let it germinate again and kill it. Shade it out. Um, I'm not a, not a big promoter of chemicals, but sometimes you just have to use them to get where you need to go. Uh, alternatively, you can smother them out with things like alfalfa, cover crops, dense coverage will shade them out. But as soon as you, as soon as you till, you can expect to plant a whole new generation. It takes about uh, three years to eliminate a weed problem in the United States where we have a longer growth season. By alternating warm and cool season, warm, warm, cool, cool uh, season cover crops, we can deplete that seed bank and, and farmers that don't till can escape weed pressure pretty much permanently. Spot here, spot there, keep an eye on it. They'll never have a big weed problem again. You guys have a very short growing season, so you have to depend more on companion crops and covering your ground to smother out and shade out weeds. And that means either your crop is dense enough to do that or you have a companion crop that grows with your, your cash crop, usually a low growing clover, and that can help smother out weeds. If you have a compaction problem, you need to realize there's a lot of people that will say, never till, never till, it's terrible. It is, it is terrible. But if your compaction is over 300 PSI to get that penetrometer through, roots cannot penetrate it. And the only way to get through that is maybe to till. And then what you need to do is come in with a really dense cover crop mix to put channels and roots down, deep, deep roots, 
so that when it recompacts, you've got all these channels through there. Now your cash crop will follow those channels. Their roots will go down those channels that your cover crop created. And it'll begin to expand. Plants, given the chance, can break up cement. So, but you have, to, you have to help them along in this regard under, under serious compaction. And that will be the last time you ever have to till, hopefully. Some really deep rooting plants, plants that are good for alleviating compaction are your forage radish, rapeseed, also called canola, rye, sun hip, asparagus. Has some of the deepest roots of any plants. It's not really considered a crop in most places, but might be worth a shot. Uh, these, these, we used asparagus when I lived in California to stabilize our hillsides because we had erosion. And it worked great. And the roots go down something like uh, 10, 15 meters. It's incredible in mature asparagus uh, plants. Sunflower, chicory, these all things with tap roots. Throw some carrots out there and then go out and pick some when you want, you know? Anything with a big tap root. If you are not asking me, the, asking yourself this question, you have not been paying attention. <laughs> so how do we get them in our soil? Well, you can go out and buy a bag of bugs, but you won't get anything native to your soil and it won't colonize your crops. So I don't recommend that route. But think about this. If that is what we fed you here for lunch, would you have come to this conference? <laughs> We can have all the vitamins and everything we want, but this is what we crave, right? Every sense in our body is telling us this is food and this is not. But I'm telling you everything you need is in here. We've got a sucrose pellet, we've got, we've got all your vitamins. Can you live like that? Would you be healthy if that was your diet? No, because you need complex molecules. You need the lignin, the roughage. That's all part of what you evolved to, to consume. You can't live on this. You'd die if you tried to live on that. It'd kill you. Yet this is how we feed our plants. This is how we feed our plants. They also need complex molecules. We may think we're more complex than plants. We got a big brain, right? Are we, are we more complex than plants? Who's got the, the bigger genome? Who's got more genes, a potato or a human? It's actually a potato. Among birds, the dumbest birds in the world, the turkey has the biggest genome. <laughs> and, and the winner of the whole contest are metamorphic insects, because all that metamorphosis takes a lot of genes. They got more genes than we do, way more. So plants are just as complicated as we are, and they have complex needs, but we often fail to recognize that. So the breakdown in their study that I mentioned earlier with Eckford and Quady, um, they found that in general, increased root colonization resulted in yield increases of 23% across all management practices. Uh, just reminding you. So that means the goal should be to increase your root colonization. If that's the winner in this contest, we should try and get higher root colonization. How do we do that? In their study, it was affected most by inoculation. I don't really recommend inoculation because you need native species in order to have your plants actually colonize. A lot of these inoculant companies are now throwing in uh, fertilizers and trace minerals to trick you into thinking that your plants are being colonized, but for the most part, they're all one species. It's a species you already have, and it's not really gonna do you any good uh, maybe if you're growing wheat, that species is called Rhizophagus interatices. On the label, they have it labeled actually wrong as Glomus interatices in most of these inoculants. But um, uh, the only thing I've ever seen that wants to colonize by it is wheat. Shark and fallow. That is, we know now that fallow is, is wrong. There should be no fallow. You should never be able to see your dirt. If you can see your soil, it's eroding. If you can see your soil, it's eroding. Think about that. You're losing it. Went to wind and rain. It happens on such a large scale that we don't realize it, but there are places in the world where they have buried coasts and look at how the soil goes down and we've lost meters of soil. Meters of soil. Just due to wind and rain. Soil disturbance. Increased colonization 7%. That just means no-till. 
But the big question is here, do you want the highest yield or the most profitable yield? In the United States, the big seed companies have contests. And people buy their seeds and put on a ton of chemicals and a ton of uh, fertilizer, and they try and get the highest yield they possibly can. And then whoever wins the contest, that seed company will slap their, their hat on them and parade them around to conferences to tell everybody how they did it. They never tell you what their profit margin was, though. Because that little bit of extra that you spent a lot of money to get probably cost more than what you got when you sold your grain. So ask yourself, do you want bragging rights or do you want a fat wallet? Because they're not the same thing. They're different targets entirely. What we really need are nutrient deficient plants. Mycorrhizal fungi induce nutrient use deficiency in, in plants. However, so here's our root colonization. And we know as phosphorus increases, root colonization decreases. And it'll go all the way to zero. I couldn't figure out how to bend my other end of the line there, but it'll go down. But we also know that plants respond to nutrients. So as our phosphorus goes up, our yields are going to increase to a point. At which point, when you go over a certain level, um, oh, there's my dot. And I didn't show it on here, but if you keep going, it's going to go down because you're going to reach toxic levels. And the amount of damage you do to your soil with, by over-fertilization is tremendous. It changes the composition of microbes in your soil. Fastidious organisms are organisms that take very little nutrients uh, to multiply. When you increase your nutrients in your soil beyond that, the guys who, like, who are pigs and want a lot of nutrients outcompete the fastidious organisms, and your whole so soil profile changes. It's like, the, it's like changing the microbes in your gut, where we live with a whole lot of microbes inside of our body. And our diet influences who's living in and on us. And the same thing happens in our soil. But the most efficient place is right there where they intersect. That's where nutrient use efficiency is highest. And we're finding that seed companies are breeding out the ability of plants to form a mycorrhizal association. Now, last year at the USDA, I found non-mycorrhizal corn. I didn't think it was possible to do that. And I went and I talked to our agronomist, and I said, why is this happening? How is it happening? And she had been to many of these big seed breeders trials and out to their farms around the world in Argentina and warm places where they grow their crops. And she said, well, the seeds companies and the chemical companies are now the same, so they're growing under high input, high chemical use. So as soon as you have a high input system, you're selecting against the mycorrhizal symbiosis. And now we have crops that can't even form the symbiosis. And we happen to think that seeds should be labeled with whether or not they're mycorrhizal. Because we're never going to be sustainable without the symbiosis in the long run. Not going to happen. We can't get there. We can't get the nutrient use efficiency that we need. So we have to maintain this in our seed bank. I call this the sweet spot where yield and colonization uh, occur at the highest, at, at the, the lowest level. If you want this little bump to get to the highest yield possible, you're going to spend more than it's worth and you're going to do serious damage to your soil. Our seed breeding needs to breed to enhance this because what we found is that as we move up and to the left here, we're going up to increase our root colonization, to the left means lower, lower uh, inputs, I'm using phosphorus as my, my metric here, to maximize the yields with the lowest inputs. This means you get the most bang for your buck, right? The more, the, the less, the more you get for each little little pound or gram of phosphorus you put in. That's what you want. You want to maximize that. And I think that's where we need to go with our seed breeding. And we are looking for seed breeders who want to work with us on this. So we'll have questions if we've got a few minutes. Do we? OK. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me.
Now, when, when, when they arrived on Wednesday, um, she only arrived very late. And we, on Thursday morning, through early, we were already on our way to Teicheruk. We started walking through our trials and stuff. And like Ken and me and some of the others had jackets on. And Wendy was there with a t shirt on. And she said, This isn't cold. I, I lived in uh, South Dakota for a while. So um, she said, As you can see, she, she knows what she's doing. <laughs> 